This morning we're uh, continuing in John chapter 7. Uh, we're looking at Jesus going to the Feast of Booze, as you'll recall. And uh, though he held back for a little bit, and it looked like he wasn't even going to go, uh, because he knew the Jews there wanted to kill him, uh, here we see him uh, go to the temple, to the most public place that you know, is the, the central, the focal point of this feast in order to teach publicly, and we see the amazement of the Jews at what it was he was teaching and his ability and his knowledge. So let's read about that in John chapter 7. Uh, we're going to be looking actually this morning at just a few verses, verses 14 through 18, and part of it we're going to be looking at this evening. So we're not going to look at everything that's here, but we do want to see a couple of, of uh, major points. This is what we read. But when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, I think you would agree with me that education is one of the more important things that, that people pursue in this world, that, that we pursue in this world today. Uh, it has been said that knowledge is power, and certainly that is true. The more you study and the more you know, uh, the more power, the more influence that you have, the more at least potentially that you can have. But what kind of knowledge is the most valuable? What's the best kind of knowledge that we can learn? What kind should you and I be pursuing? Well, as you know, there's a variety of, of uh, opinions on this in the world. Is it what uh, Dale Carnegie believed? And I think you know, this is something that's affected our culture in a number of ways. The, the most valuable knowledge you can have is how you can win friends and influence people. I believe Dale Carnegie was one who was famous for, for teaching people how to be salesmen. You know, how do you get ahead in this world in anything that you do? Well, you learn how to influence people. Well, is, is that the most important thing? Is it learning what you need to learn to become the most successful that you possibly can be in your particular vocation? Is success, the things that lead to success, is that the most important? Is it those things that will give you the ability to make more money or to become perhaps the richest in the world or that which will make you famous? Well, as Christians, we know that there is something far more important than these things, and that is the knowledge of God's kingdom. How to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, there's a lot of people out there who don't know, and they're perishing how to live in the kingdom of heaven, how to become great in the kingdom of heaven. You remember that at the end of the road, there are, uh, well, there is a day of judgment and there are rewards for those who will serve him. To know how to be great in the kingdom of heaven is very important. You can have a lot of friends. You can be able to influence a lot of people. You can be the best at what you do. You can become rich, you can become famous, but you know that when the day comes, when God is going to judge all men, none of these things are really going to matter. The only thing that will is whether or not you're going to enter God's kingdom and how great your reward is going to be on that day. Now, if that is true, and everybody who is a believer knows that that is true, what can you do to learn more about these things? Well, as I've already mentioned, there's really only one way, one way that the Lord has given to us, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is 
our priest who offers himself up as a sacrifice for our sins. He is our king who rules over us, but he is also our prophet who declares to us the will of God for our salvation and for our well-being. The best way to learn anything is to be taught by somebody who knows that subject very well. That's the reason why we go to colleges, the reason why we go to universities, in order to learn from people who know. Well, God has given to us the best possible teacher. He sent His Son into the world that we might know His truth and by His grace not only enter into heaven but also have a full reward. Now this morning I, I simply want us to consider two things from this text. The first is that God has given to us the best possible teacher in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the applicational point is the second point. The only way that you can know that Jesus is this kind of teacher, that He is, as a matter of fact, the one that the Father has sent into the world, that He has come down from heaven with divine teaching, is if you are willing to submit to His teaching. Jesus says that's the only way that you can know. If anyone is willing to do His will, he will know of the teaching whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. So first, let's consider that God has given to us the best possible teacher in Jesus. Now, we saw earlier in this chapter that Jesus was not willing to go up to Jerusalem, he said, because his time had not yet come. Now, Jesus did not mean that he wasn't going to go up to the feast at all because not to have gone to this feast would have been sin. This was a required feast. But we saw that he was not willing to go up at that time with them, with his brothers, because if he had gone up with them in a public way rather than in a secret way, he likely would have been ambushed along the way. They were looking for Jesus. They were waiting for him to come. They knew he was going to come because he wouldn't sin by not making that feast. So they were looking for him, and if they happened to find him outside the city, away from the people, he would have been far more vulnerable. And again, let me just remind you that if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that life is necessarily going to be, uh, in a certain sense, safe for you. Living the Christian life can be very dangerous. It's one of the reasons why we're having this prayer meeting for Saeed Abedini. He's in prison because of his living the Christian life, because he did more than just be a private Christian and keep the truth to himself, but he, he shared it. He went to places where it wasn't popular to share it. And now he's in prison. Living the Christian life is not going to make you popular in the eyes of the world. They were looking for Jesus to kill him. If you live the Christian life, you're more likely going to have many enemies, even as Jesus did. I mean, he lived perfectly, didn't he? He was perfect love incarnate. And he did nothing but love other people by telling them the truth. And yet no one was hated more than he was. But I do want you to remember that even though the Lord calls you to live this kind of life, Jesus never commands you to put your life at risk unnecessarily. You don't have to put yourself in harm's way. Many of the early Christians remember when Rome was throwing the Christians to the lions, realizing that the death of a martyr was, was something that God particularly blesses, actually turned themselves into the Romans to be eaten by the lion so that they could have a better resurrection. The Lord is not calling you to do that. We saw there was one occasion where Charles Wesley went out and, and he preached at a farmhouse and the people who hated him knew he was there and they began to, to look for him and the woman who's, who owned that house basically hid him. Charles Wesley didn't just jump out and say, here I am, you know, destroy me. But he hid himself until the danger passed over. We can avoid these risks and these dangers, at least some of them. Like Jesus, we can take a less conspicuous route to go where God would have us to go and serve Him. In other words, we don't have to put ourselves up against the wall for the firing squad to shoot at us. There are times when we can hide ourselves. Now Jesus knew that they had already reached the point where they wanted to kill Him simply because He had healed a man on the Sabbath. But the time he would lay down his life for his people 
that time when he would lay down his life for you and for me if you have trusted him had not yet come. And so he wasn't willing to give himself over into their hands. He went up secretly. But now secondly, I want you to notice that, again that this did not mean that Jesus was afraid. This did not mean that Jesus was a coward. Because even though they wanted to kill him, he was still willing to do something that was very dangerous. He was still willing to teach publicly. I want you to notice that what John writes in verse 14. But when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. If it was out of fear that Jesus didn't go up, we see here that that could not be the case. Now, there are times, as I've already said, that you can avoid danger, but there's also times when you can't avoid danger, when to do so would be to deny the Lord Jesus Christ, when doing God's will would put you at risk. I mean, let me just point out to you one example, and that is Stephen. When he was arrested and stood before the council, stood before the Sanhedrin to answer the false charges which were laid at his feet, he didn't hide his commitment to Christ. He didn't deny Jesus Christ so that he might save his skin, but rather he confessed Jesus Christ, he confessed him boldly, and he even denounced the sins of the council that was sitting in judgment on him, knowing that to do so would likely mean his death, and as a matter of fact, Stephen was put to death because of his confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are times when you and I need to be willing to face even death, in serving your Lord, and of course, if we must be willing to face death, how much more should we be willing to face the ire of our family members and friends and people with whom we work for sharing the gospel with them? But let's not forget, when the Lord calls you to do this, when he calls you to make these sacrifices, that he will not only give you the courage that you need in order to do that, he is also going to multiply your reward. I mean, how do we get the rewards in heaven that the Lord promises? It's not for breathing. It's not for eating. It's not from just living day to day and doing the work that we do unless we do it for the glory of God, but is particularly in laying down our lives and sharing the gospel with others as our Lord calls us to do. Now, thirdly, I want you to notice the caliber of Jesus' teaching here. Those who heard him were amazed. John writes in verse 15, the Jews then were astonished, and they were astonished not only because <laughs> this one that they knew that they were looking for to kill, and, and if these were not the ones who wanted to kill him, at least knew that there were people who did want to kill him, they were astonished that he was speaking publicly, but they were astonished at what he was teaching. Then the Jews then were astonished, saying, how has this man become learned, having never been educated. Uh, they really couldn't believe that somebody who hadn't been educated in their schools could know that much about God's truth. And I would say communicate it in the way that he did. Now, this is a reminder to us that you don't have to go to college necessarily. You don't have to go to theological schools in order to learn what the Bible says. God has other ways in which he can teach you. I mean, how is it that Jesus knew as much as he did? He didn't go to their schools. Well, how did he know so much? Well, we might be tempted to think it's because Jesus is God in human flesh, that he has all knowledge, he has infinite knowledge. We know that God is unlimited in every way. Now, that is true. But let's not forget that Jesus did not have that divine knowledge in his human nature. Jesus had the limitations that we have, the limitations of humanity. He didn't have access, or at least full access, to his divine knowledge. Because if he had, then Jesus never could have said, that day and that hour of God's judgment upon this city, Jerusalem, I don't even know when that is. Nobody knows, not even the angels, but the Father alone. Now, how could Jesus say that if he had you know, unlimited knowledge? He, he really couldn't say that. Jesus had the limitations of humanity. We might be tempted to think that Jesus was such a great teacher and he knew so much because he was anointed with the Spirit, as we've seen. That this knowledge came from the Holy Spirit. 
Now, that does have a lot to do with this, of course. John writes, as we saw in our meditation in John 3.34, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure, not that Jesus gives the Spirit to his people, but that the Father gives the Spirit to Jesus above measure. Jonathan Edwards argued that that is, is how Jesus knew what he knew of his divine knowledge. It came to him through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God communicated. That certainly has something to do with this. But let's also not forget what we saw earlier, that Jesus learned in the same way that you learn and the same way that, that I learn. We read earlier in Luke 2.40, the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And verse 52, and Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now again, let me ask you, if Jesus had infinite knowledge, how could he be said to increase in wisdom. He would already have infinite wisdom. You can't increase infinity. Jesus learned. And let me just point out one other thing about Jesus, and that is that Jesus was an effective learner. And the reason why he was is because he had the greatest love and respect and regard for his Father's Word. When his parents taught him, as they would do as faithful Jews, Jesus listened to them. When Jesus went to the synagogue, as all faithful Jews would, on the Sabbath, he paid attention to what the teachers were teaching. When he went to the temple, he asked questions, and he listened to their answers so that he could learn. He wanted to know what his father said. So how do you and I become effective teachers? How do we learn the Bible? Well, we have to do what Jesus did, okay? You don't need a degree in the Bible. You don't have to go to the colleges, the universities. You don't need seminary training, although we would admit that some of that training can be useful. It can also be counterproductive. If somebody goes to a liberal seminary, they can lose their faith because they never really had faith to begin with, of course. If you go to a good one, there are things you can learn. You don't need to do that, though, but you do need what is there, and that is a teacher. You need a teacher to learn. That's why God gave us teachers, was so that we might learn his word. And we know quite clearly from Scripture that God does give teachers to his church. You need to listen to those teachers that he gives to you, those who teach you in your home, those who teach you in the church. And let's not forget, you need one other very important element. You need God's spirit. Without him, you're never going to pay attention. You're not going to listen to what he says because you're not going to have the love and respect and regard for the Word of God that you should have. Not just that kind of fear that the scribes had if they you know, make too many mistakes or if they don't wash before they write the name of God. That's almost a superstitious fear. But the kind of respect that comes from the Spirit of God, the kind that gives you the love and regard for the Word of God that you want to know what... The Lord says, because you want to do it and you want to believe it. If you're, going to, if you're going to give him this kind of attention, you need this. So you need to listen to your teachers, you need to study, and you need the Spirit of God to help you focus with the kind of focus and receive what it is that the Lord has to tell you. Now, I mentioned before, Jesus not only had a great deal of knowledge that came to him in these variety of ways, Jesus also knew how to communicate that knowledge. These Jews were astonished not only by the depth of his knowledge, not only by the fact that he was willing to stand publicly in the middle of those who wanted to kill him, but also by his ability to teach these things. At the end of the feast, when the chief priests and the Pharisees are going to send officers to take Jesus, they're going to return empty-handed. And then the chief priests and the, or the Pharisees are going to ask him, why did you not bring him? And they will respond, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. Jesus not only had a huge amount of knowledge, true knowledge regarding God's will, he could effectively communicate that knowledge. 
So the Father has not only given to us a teacher, He has given to us the best of teachers. He has given to us one who knows His subject well and has the ability to communicate it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, realizing that the most important knowledge that you and I can possibly have is the knowledge of the kingdom of heaven. And knowing that the Father has given to us such an effective teacher, what should we do? Obviously, we need to listen to Him. We need to listen to what He has to tell us because what He says is true. You know, the opinion of men means nothing. What people think God wants means nothing. If somebody teaches something that isn't God's will, it means nothing. God's not going to judge us on our opinions. What, you know, if we want to know the difference between right and wrong, it's not going to come from what we think. It's going to come from what God says. He has given to us His Son, and we need to listen to Him. Now, let me just note in passing that, and again, this, this is related, but not by far the most important thing. If, if you want to be able to teach well, if you're a teacher by profession or you're a parent that is charged with the teaching of your children or simply a believer who wants to communicate your faith uh, efficiently or effectively, then here is the example that you need to follow. Know your subject. Learn it well. Learn to communicate it well. I mean, Jesus was a great communicator, wouldn't you say? He was able to draw analogies from everything around him. Uh, Spurgeon was somebody <clears throat> who seems to have perfected that particular element in Jesus with all the different concrete illustrations that he used. But remember that you need to do this also with the power that can only come from a heart that is fully in love with the subject. In other words, you have to show that you care about what you're talking about if you are hoping to instill that same kind of enthusiasm in those whom you teach. Now, in this case, what that means is you need the Spirit of God if you're going to communicate the gospel in an effective way. Learn the truth. Learn the mechanics of how to communicate it effectively, but have the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Spirit as you communicate that subject if you want to communicate the gospel effectively like Jesus did. We're never going to measure up to what he was able to do, but we should try to get as close as we possibly can. Now let me just note in passing another very important element that we're going to look at more this evening, and that is that Jesus didn't take credit for this teaching. He gave all the glory to his Father for this uh, because, again, as he responds to their astonishment, how did this man, how does he know so much and how is he able to communicate like this, never having been learned? Jesus says in verse 16, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. This is going to become very important in distinguishing true teachers from false, which is what we're going to look at this evening. But I want you to notice that Jesus did not seek his own glory. He didn't want to glorify himself but again expresses his role of a servant uh, who comes in subjection to the Father to draw attention to him. Uh, that is also a very important element to our communication of the gospel. If the Lord should give you the opportunity to share the gospel, you, you need um, to teach that truth, but give him the glory for it. If the Lord allows you to do this effectively, glorify him and do not glorify yourself. So again, the first point is the Father has given us the best. He's given us the humblest teacher in our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, how can you know this? How can you know that Jesus really was sent from the Father? How can you know that what he teaches you really is God's truth? I mean, we, we saw a whole barrage of people last night in the movie I think many of them said that they were actually raised in Christian homes. Some of them even said they were Christians until they became convinced that evolution was true and it led them away from God. And again, was it because of the strength of the argument of evolution? <laughs> Couldn't be that because there's not a shred of evidence that it, that, it's, that it could possibly be true. It was the disposition of their hearts. And so we see that there is something more that needs to be there. Besides the fact that the Bible says that Jesus is a teacher, 
sent from God. Well, what does Jesus say that we need in order to be convinced that this is true? Well, he continues in verse 17. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. And I think Jesus there is basically saying you'll know whether this is divine teaching or just the teaching of men. The only way you can know is if you are willing to submit to him in what he says. If you are, then you can know that what he says is from God. Now let me just say something here because Jesus almost seems to be distinguishing what he's saying from what God is saying. Is Jesus telling us here that, that he isn't God, uh, that his teaching is not from God? No, uh, he isn't saying that because we do need to remember who Jesus is. I mean, what is another name for Jesus? The Logos, the Word of God, the spoken Word of God. It was his spirit that inspired the prophets of the Old Testament. He's the one who gave the Scriptures. It's the same spirit by which he spoke. And remember, you know, we're talking about the man Christ Jesus and the spirit by which he would direct the writers of the New Testament to write what it is that they wrote. We do need to remember that when Jesus says this, he is speaking here as a man from his human nature, as one who comes in the role of a servant, as one who has limited knowledge and wisdom, but one who is declaring the boundless knowledge and wisdom which he possesses in his divine nature. That which he learns, as we saw, from the scriptures, from his parents, from the teachers in the synagogue, from the teachers in the temple, declaring that which was communicated to him by the Holy Spirit, as we saw before. Now, Jesus is not saying what I'm saying is not from God, but what he's saying is if I spoke as a man speaks, my own opinion. You see, that's not what he's giving us. He's giving us the word of God. Now, how can you know that that is the word of God? that it is his truth and not that merely of a man. Again, you can only know if you're willing to do his will. And what does that mean? I think he means, first of all, that you can find out by testing it for yourself. Believe it. Submit to it. Do it. And you will discover that it is, in fact, true. In other words, put it to the test. David writes in Psalm 34, verse 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, how are you going to know whether what David says is true or false? Well, you have to come to him and taste him, as it were. Find out for yourself that he is good. Put him to the test in, in the good sense. You know, um, okay, you, you say that if I come and, and taste, I'll see that you're good. So I'm going to come and taste and see that you're good. If you don't know whether Jesus is who he says he is, if you're not fully convinced that what he says is from God, then come to him and find out for yourselves. Repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and see if he isn't in fact true. See if he doesn't prove himself to you. Taste and see if the Lord isn't in fact good. You will find that he is. But I do believe there's another sense in which your willingness to submit to his will will show you that Jesus does in fact speak God's truth and that is through the witness of his spirit. Let me just remind you what we've already uh, been reminded of, not necessarily from the sermon but from some things that have already happened today in our prayers if you were here early, earlier for the prayer time, that we were born dead in sin completely unable to submit to God's will because of our unwillingness to do it, not because God was stopping us, but because we didn't want to, and the reason we didn't want to was because we hated it. Okay, that's the way we come into this world. Paul writes in Romans 8, 7, again, a verse that I quote many times. By the way, it's always good to know the classic texts 
of why we believe what we believe. Here is one that cannot be overcome by anybody who thinks we still have a spark of goodness and an inclination towards God's will. So all we have to do is have it presented to us in the right way and we're going to accept it. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't matter how you coat it. doesn't matter how you present it. doesn't matter how you paint it. If you give it to somebody who has no taste for it and who is hostile toward it, they will not receive it. That's what this passage tells us. Paul writes in Romans, Romans 8, verse 7, The mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God for it is not even able to do so. This is how we come into the world. This is why we would never have received grace that is offered to us in the gospel unless the Lord had done something in our hearts. But the fact is, He did. He sent His Spirit to change our hearts. If we're trusting in Him this morning, you were dead in that kind of a situation, but Paul says He made you alive. And when He raised you to life, He gave you the desire to obey or to submit to Him. Paul writes in Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, in other words, we would submit to them, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, let's consider what Jesus says from this perspective. And again, John gives us this perspective over and over again in this gospel. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. If you are willing to do his will, you will know. Why? Because if you're willing, you have his spirit. If you have his spirit, you have his witness within you that what Jesus teaches is in fact the Word of God. We talked about, you know, this idea of knocking down evolution and showing intelligent design as pre-evangelism. Pre it can't change anybody's heart. Only the Spirit of God can do that. And when He does, He gives you a full conviction that what Jesus says is in fact from God. This is what the two uh, men on the road to Emmaus experienced when they were traveling with Jesus. They said after he vanished from their sight, they said in Luke 24, 32, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? You see, that burning of conviction, which in their case was experiential, was the witness of the Spirit bearing witness to them that what Jesus said to them was the truth. And if you're willing to submit to Him because you have the Spirit of God, then you will know that what Jesus says is the truth because you'll have that internal witness of the Holy Spirit. And so I would ask you in closing this morning, do you have that witness? Does the Spirit of God bear witness to your spirit when you read the Word of God that there is something that you're reading here that is above what man can write? You know, it's, it's not the same when you read the Bible versus when you read, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey or, or any other religious writing of men or any other book. It doesn't read like a novel. It doesn't just affect you in the same way. When you read the Bible, there is that witness of the Spirit of God that is showing you that there is something more here than just the Word of man. It's something that works in your heart. It's, you, you've tasted it. You've seen it. That's the work of the Spirit of God in illumination is showing you the, the glory of God in the Word and showing you the beauty of God so He focuses your attention. Now, I'm not saying do you always have that to its fullest measure so that every time you pick it up, your hearts burn like the two on the road to Emmaus, but do you sense something different in the Bible, in God's Word, than what you sense from any other book that you read? Well, if you have the witness of the Holy Spirit, that's what you'll have. Is that what you do experience? If you do, then you have basically what Jesus said. If you're willing to submit to his will, you will know the teaching. You see, you need to have not only that, that conviction, but you also have to have that evidence of submission to the word of God. If you have those two things, you have the spirit, and you know that what Jesus says is in fact the word of God. 
But what if you don't have that witness? What if you don't have that conviction? What if you don't have that submission to the will of God? Then what do you need to do? Well, you need to come to Jesus. You need to ask Him for His Spirit because He is the only one who can give you the Spirit. He is the only one who can save you. You cannot change your, your own heart. As we, well, as we saw earlier, we're hostile against God. And we read in Scripture that even as, and again, this is what Scripture says, even as the Ethiopian can't change the color of his skin, even as the leopard cannot change his spots, so that you cannot do good who are accustomed to doing evil. That is a work of God's Spirit alone. Jesus is the only one who can give the Spirit. So if you don't have that witness, that conviction, if you don't have that submission to God's Word, then you need to come to Christ to give you His Holy Spirit. And I pray that by God's grace, you'll acknowledge that and you will come to Him and ask Him and receive that grace. Now this evening we're going to consider what Jesus tells us in this passage and other passage regarding how to recognize those who come to us who are false prophets. I mean, this is how we recognize um, that what we're getting is, is the Word of God and that what Jesus teaches us is the Word of God, but how do we recognize those who come to us and say that they're bringing to us God's Word, but they bring to us something else? How do we recognize false prophets? So I would encourage you to come back this evening, not only, of course, to learn more about that and what Jesus has to say about that, but to worship the Lord. As Christians, that's what he calls us to do. That's why he gave us this day is that we might worship him. We need to. It's our desire. It's good for us. So by God's grace, may he bring each one of us back. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask that he would take what we've learned this morning and, and apply it to our lives.